going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 5. We started this book last week, and um, it's, a, it's a great, great book. And it's interesting because we read it, um, or when we read it, it's easy to kind of, um, kind of assume we know who Moses is talking to. And I hope that you caught last week what, what I mentioned to you, and that is that the whole first four chapters of the book, and it actually continues right in, into chapter 5 as well, you got to remember who Moses is speaking to. Keep in mind, the children of Israel are just done with 40 years of wandering. And God's promised them this land, and they're excited about it. Uh, but the reason that they've wandered for 40 years was because of fear and disobedience. And so God, uh, they, they had the chance of the land 40 years earlier, <coughs> Excuse me, but instead of taking it, they were afraid. And so they chose not to take what God was giving them. And so God said, no problem, but you're going to wander for 40 years. You will not enter into this land, but your kids will. Now, the people that Moses is speaking to right now in, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's the kids, but they're not kids anymore. They're the adults. All of that older generation died. And except for three people, there's three people who have not yet died who, uh, who are around. Anybody know the names of those three people? Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. Geniuses. I'm done teaching because you're brilliant. Okay. So, three people. Now, only two of them are going to enter the promised land though, right? God said to Moses, you're not going to enter and you misrepresented me. You're not going to enter into the land. So chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, which we looked at all last week, Moses reiterates things that had happened to their parents that brought them to the point that they were at right now. And so it's, and, and, and let me put it like this. God gave the law, and then now they've been working it out for 40 years. And you say, what do you mean by working it out? What I mean is they're, 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 they're trying to keep the law. They're figuring out, wait, this didn't work or what does this mean, or how does this look, or how am I supposed to react to this? They don't know. Nobody's ever tried before. And so they're, they're 40 years of practicing keeping the law, figuring out what's working. God has added some things. God has, has explained some things in those 40 years. And now they're about to enter into the land that God's promised them. And so they are being given this kind of, these sermons is what Deuteronomy is, they're giving these sermons to prepare them for entering into God's promises. And so the book of Deuteronomy is actually, off, it's one of the most oft-quoted books by Jesus. He quoted Deuteronomy many times. Why? Because it's not a technical book. It's a very practical book. So Leviticus is the technical book to what Deuteronomy is, a very practical book. Deuteronomy helps people to know, here's, here's what the rules were. Here's what it looks like. And then maybe the most important thing of all, why God wants your obedience. And in fact, the book of Deuteronomy is going to use, the, is use this word more than any other book in the five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And it's the word love. God loves you. And he wants your obedience. Moses is going to say it over and over and over. We already saw it last week. So here we are in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Moses is preparing a new generation to take hold of God's promises. One more thing before I get into it. Long introduction. Sometimes in our lives, it's easier to hope for something than to be able to grab hold of that thing. Like, oh, eventually, oh, eventually, oh, eventually. And then the day comes when it's no longer eventually. And you have it and you're like, oh, wow. What do, I don't know, I, I'm not ready for this right? Anybody have kids in college, right? And when your kid first went to college, you're like, no, you were like, I don't think they'll survive. <laughs> I'm not sure they're going to survive it. And then at the end, you're like, wow, they're an adult. They're an adult. They're actually a human being now, like an adult human being. And I remember I'm, uh, with two of them, they'd say, oh my gosh, you know, this is never going to be over. And then they get to the last semester and they're like, I can't believe it's already over, right? And Oh, one day I'm going to be out in the, in the real world, and we keep telling him, you don't want that, trust me. Get good grades, stay in school as long as you can. And then the real world comes, and you go, oh my gosh, I have to be an adult now, right? I'm just depressing all of you. 
Sometimes it's easier to say, oh, I really wish this would happen in my life. And then what happens when you actually get it? And Moses is preparing the people for getting the things that God said he was going to give. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Moses called all Israel and he said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. Verse 2, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time, to declare to you the word of the Lord. You were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up the mountain. And then he goes on, but many of these people remember this event because they were children there. They were children when God spoke from heaven on the mountain. He spoke with fire, and there was, we read that there was great smoke and great fire, and the earth was trembling. And they were there because they're the children of those and, and it's interesting because Moses acknowledges, even at this moment, God recognized the promises were for you, not even for your parents. These promises were going to be for you in your lifetime. And so, uh, even though, and this is an interesting thing, even though they were the children, these promises applied to them. That God knew that this was going to matter in their life. 40-something years down the road. And so there was this, this sense where Moses is saying, don't settle. God's spoken to you. God's given you promises. Now I want you to learn how to walk in them. Verse 6, the Lord said this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You will have no other gods before me. You will not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You will not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. uh, This is the Ten Commandments, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. Moses reiterates many of the same laws that they they heard their entire lives. Okay? And so we talked a lot about this in Exodus chapter 20, but there's a few things that are kind of a little bit like unique in the way that Moses described them. Um, But this is one of those things. When he says that um, God will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. I can't tell you how often that is misquoted or misunderstood. And it usually goes like this. Um, My grandparents' sins, God's still punishing me for those. So I'm being punished or maybe something in my life because of something that happened in my parents or my parents' parents or who knows how far back, third or fourth generation, I'm still, or, or it looks like this, I better be good because otherwise my great-grandkids are going to suffer for my actions today. Okay. And so what's interesting is this, this idea is still out there that people are still believing this. And it's ironic because God in two different books of the Old Testament, Ezekiel and in Jeremiah, God said, this is not what I mean. I will not punish your children for your sins. So that means the way we've understood that what this concept has, has often been wrong. Okay? God is not looking. You are not, the, you are not being cursed by God for something your parents did. Like manner. Your kids are. In fact, if that were true, listen, here's the easiest way to prove that's not what God's saying. If that were true, Why are the children of the parents that were disobedient getting the promises of God? Should have been five generations, right? Why is that not happening? Because that's not what God was talking about. Now, let me say this, though, because this is a true statement. That it is often, without the Lord in your life, you and I will repeat some of the same bad habits that we grew up learning. That's that's a fact. But God is not saying that he is personally going to punish you for something that your grandparents did or your great-grandparents. So there's a big misunderstanding, okay? Especially when we talk about, in fact, right here it says, God says, I'm a jealous God. So it's easy to think God's like vindictive and, and he's jealous and he's going to hurt and he's going to punish. 
Did you know the same word for jealous here is synonymous with another word used all the time in the Old Testament? And it's a word we love. It's the word zealous. By the way, it's just ironic that they're close in English. They're not close in Hebrew. But it's the same, it's the same exact concept. When God says, I'm jealous, the, the Hebrew mind would have heard that God is so zealous for you. He's so in love with you. He's so passionate about you. He's so passionate for you. Um, the best way I could describe it is like a parent, okay? You watch your kid go through something and it makes us sad. You watch them do something that you know. You look at them and you're like, I know that the direction that you're going in is destructive. And But you also know, because you've been a parent a while, that if you tell them the path that you're going down is just is destructive, then that's exactly where they're going to go, right? So you're trying to figure out, like, I know it's not going to be good, but somehow it's not connecting. It's not going through. And we hate seeing our kids go through things that we know are going to hurt them. God is zealous for your best. God wants the best for you. God is not looking to punish you. So when God says to the third and the fourth generation, he's not speaking about punishing you in the same way. In fact, what's interesting is the same word that is used here, it says that he'll visit, uh, he'll visit the children to the third and the fourth generations, visiting the iniquity. You know, it's the same word used to say witness. That God is going to be with your family generation after generation after generation. God is not looking to punish your family, but he's looking to be a part of our families. And so maybe some of us would say, I don't, my, some of my kids, you know, you might say, I have a kid who's not walking with the Lord today. Know this right now. God's still with them. He's not giving up. God isn't giving up. He still, he loves them. Are they doing things that you know are so destructive because you've lived a little longer? Totally. But does God still love them? Absolutely. He's not giving up on them. He's visiting. He is there. He's paying attention. <coughs> Excuse me. He's saying when you rebel, your family's not going to pay that price. Not like that. But there is a sense in which, apart from the Lord, cycles do not get broken, do they? We keep doing the same things over and over. You know, Joy and I, we, in, we would, in Hungary, we, we taught a lot of like, we were at a college, so... If a guy and a girl came over to our house to talk, we knew what they wanted to talk about. You know, everybody got engaged at the Bible college. It was just like, <coughs> there was a year I did, I think I did 15 different weddings between church and school, you know. And, and, and you know, they'd come over and they're like, we really have something we need to talk about. And we'd try to act surprised every time. Like, oh, really? What is it? <laughs> you know, well, you know, we're kind of interested. Oh, wow, we're so surprised. You know, why we never thought that's why you'd be coming over, you know. This thing. And so we would do a lot of kind of counseling with young couples, and it was fun. It was always exciting, you know, and you, <laughs> and you think of them, and you see how, you know, you see their lives beginning, and you see this whole kind of process happening. And God's for you. God's not against you. You know, you watch them, and, they, and they, you know, nothing's going to go bad, you know. And then you start talking to them about issues, you know. How's your communication going? Oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing ever, you know. I, I was like, after a while, I said, you know, I love doing premarital counseling, but I really like doing postmarital, like once you're married. Like once you got married and you're like, I thought our communication was so good, but, you know, and then you, you kind of begin to realize a little, you know, do you guys, I, we would always ask them, you guys ever get in arguments and how do you resolve those? No, we would never fight. You, I love you, I love you, you know, we're like, I'm going to throw up now, you know. It's when you know you've been married a while when you're gagged by these cute couples, you know. So, you know, and, and like trying to teach them and help them to learn how to deal with, you know, and quite often it's, and, and I know it was for us too, for Joy and I, and I know it's for many of these young couples, you know, I, we would ask them questions like, well, how did your parents deal with problems? Oh, my dad was terrible dealing with these things, and he would, you know, and okay. And then usually the, the girl would say, sometimes you do that. Stab in the heart, you know. How did your mom deal with problems? Oh, this is kind of, a, yeah, sometimes you do it like that too. Or I'm trying to do the exact opposite of everything they did and I'm not doing a very good job. The point is this. All of us have been affected by the people that were a part of our lives as we grew up. Good or bad, it's not, that's, I'm not 
mentioning good, or whether it was really good or bad. Your, your impression of it might be different than what it was. Not the point. All of us are products, in many ways, of how we were raised. It's only Jesus that can break the cycle of that. So if you had, you know, if you didn't have a great home life, or you saw a bad marriage, that doesn't mean you're going to have a bad marriage. You can have an amazing marriage because of Jesus. Or maybe you didn't have the best parents, but you could be the best parents. Why? Because of the Lord. Because of God's Spirit in your life. In other words, you do not have to just be what was before you. That's not how God works in our lives. He is a transformer of character. So, we're not going to be just a product of, what, of how we were raised, good or bad. You might be thinking it's only bad, but like, I look, you know, I, had a gr- I have a great dad. I would love to get to, but I'm not him. I'm me. I'm trying to figure out how to be me, right? I wish I could be more like him in many ways. Some of you might say, no, I had a terrible dad. I don't want to be anything like him. Well, you might succeed at that. That doesn't mean you're good. Do you see what I'm talking about? We need God to transform us. And that's individual, that's personal. Look at verse 10. But he's showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you will labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, not you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor your cattle, Basically, verse 14 says nobody. Verse 15, and remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, there's something a little different in Deuteronomy 5 than the way God described the Sabbath in Exodus 20. In Exodus 20, God said you should keep the Sabbath holy, and I'm, I'm making it shorter for, for time's sake. And then he says this, you should keep the Sabbath holy, and here's why. Because God made Adam and Eve, and then he rested on the seventh day. So the justification for keeping a Sabbath was because God rested on the seventh day. Notice what happened here in Deuteronomy 5. In Deuteronomy 5, things have have gone forward. Life has happened. There's been a whole bunch of change. And now God says, the reason I want you to keep the Sabbath holy is because you were once slaves in Egypt, and I rescued you out of that life. And what's the point? The point is this. There was not one reason why Sabbath was important. There's many. And, oh, and in several different instances throughout the Old Testament will be added another reason why Sabbath would matter. Why the idea of keeping the Sabbath would matter. So Deuteronomy gives us a little change. So when we read these things, I'm trying to highlight the things that are a little different rather than just the same one over and over. But here, this is a little change. The reason that you should consider keeping the Sabbath a day of rest is because God rescued you from Egypt. You did nothing on that. You did nothing to, you were at rest and God came in and rescued you. When we were in Israel, do you guys remember our Israel peeps? Do you remember they told us on the day of, on Sabbath, (coughs) there's going to be, there's two elevators in the hotel and one of them had a big sign that said Sabbath elevator. What the, and and our, our guide was very quick to remind everybody, don't get on that elevator, okay? Not on the Sabbath. Why? Because none of the buttons worked. You could push everything you want, nothing's working. And it was the most frustrating elevator experience of your life. It was hell on an elevator because it literally stopped at every single floor. And the doors would open. And you're like, it's like Hotel California here. And then they would close Next floor. And then sometimes it would go, I mean, it was just a skittish thing. But if you, wanted to, if you wanted to keep Sabbath, they have an elevator for you in Israel that'll help you to keep Sabbath. And so as time was going on, there was more reasons given to the children of Israel why Sabbath was important. And the reason that Sabbath was not important in Deuteronomy chapter, or why it was important in Deuteronomy 5 was because God rescued you and he wants you to understand that you did it, you did nothing to earn that salvation. He did it all for you. He came at night and rescued you. So the idea of Sabbath is not a static. There's many reasons. Verse 16. Look at verse 16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long, 
and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Again, this is a change. In Exodus 20, God says all of that except for this part, that it may be well with you. This is an addition here in Deuteronomy 5. Why does that matter? I think it matters because what Moses adds here, what God adds in context, is that, you know, I think it's easy to, like, if, I mean, maybe if you grew up in a Christian home or you raised your kids, that way, you always say, hey, you need to honor your parents so you could live a long life. But then you start to think about it and you think, like, is living a long life the goal? <laughs> not really. Living a long life is not the goal. What does he add here? That it may be well with you. You know, you know what matters? It's not about just long life. It's living a, a life that was well lived. And so what is, the idea of honoring your parents, and by the way, I really believe this has more context for adults than it does for just like young kids. Like we learn how to honor our parents even as we get older. How, what, how can I honor my parents? Why? That it might be well for your life. And so Moses connects the idea of living well to honoring our parents, honoring those before us. You know, I'm, I mean, tell, I'm, because I see so many of us that were in Israel, my friend is the one who has been doing our tours. He's a wonderful man. He's a, he was, um, his parents are from what used to be Hungary, um, though it's now Romania. It used to be Hungary, so we've had a deep connection for many, many years. And, um, you know, he's told me several times about how, you know, his parents, most of his family died in the Holocaust. And uh, they, they came when he was just a little kid. And he was really hard for him. His dad would never talk to him about, about the Holocaust, about their life before Israel. And then my friend, his name is Roni. Roni would end up growing up in Israel. He's tough, he's strong. They're, and I mean this in a, you don't usually use the word in a positive, but there's an arrogance that we're going to, we're strong, we're in control. The man was a soldier. He was a warrior. And he just, for his whole life, he said, I really didn't have, I, I disrespected my dad because I didn't honor the fact that what he went through, because he wouldn't talk to me, he wouldn't explain it. And he said, it was interesting, and he told our group this, this is, brings us to context. He said, you know, now as I had kids, and now I've got, you know, you know, my kids are adults, my dad is talking a lot about his life in the past. And he says, you know, now he's like 80-something, and now he won't stop talking, <laughs> he just keeps talking, you know, all the time. And he said, but he's telling stories about what it was like to grow up in the ghetto, being a Jew, and how hard it was, and why they didn't fight back, and why. And he said, you know, you'd think that we loved our, we honored those that were Holocaust survivors. He says, but we never did for years and decades. And I think when I, when I, and I when he was, he shared that with our team, and him and I have had a lot of talks about that. And I thought, I think the idea of honoring your parents, we've taken to be very singularly focused, your parents, but I think there's something more being said there. It's honoring your fathers and your mothers, honoring those that went before you. It's not just, you know, like I can disrespect everybody else but my parents. No, no, no. There needs to be an honor that is shown to all those that have gone before us, you know. And you say, oh, but I don't agree with them. And it's interesting how one generation can't agree with the one right before them, but the one right after has a better connection to them. Oh, I understand you. I get that a little bit more. And I think that we can keep learning how to, and it's, it, it's well for our souls when we honor those that have gone before us. Verse 17, don't murder. I hope I don't need to explain that one too much. If I do, don't, don't talk to me about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm scared of you now. Um, don't commit adultery. Do not steal. Verse 20, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Verse 21, do not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that's your neighbor's. Verse 22, these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added, no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and he gave them to me. So Moses has now reiterated the Ten Commandments to the children who, for the most part, heard all of this the first time. Now they're being brought into this as the adults. It's now yours. You are now kind of responsible for the keeping of God's word and the passing of it on to the next generation. Verse 23, so it was, when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, <coughs> while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness. We have heard his voice. 
We have seen this day that God speaks with man and he still lives. And now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? You go near, you hear all the Lord our God may say, and tell us what God says, and we will hear and do it. Again, this is a reminder. It's interesting because he says, you did this, and you did this, and you did this. Why? Because they had to take ownership of where they were coming from. This was their story. This was what happened with their parents. Their parents did that. And so he's saying, this is, this is your story now. And what's the story? It's really simple. God spoke from heaven, freaked them all out, and they came to Moses and said, please become the mediator between God and us. Okay? And I think that, yeah, they were afraid. They were afraid. You know, and your kid's crying all night. These were probably the kids who were crying all night, by the way. Having nightmares of, you know, what was that loud voice? Oh, that was our God. <laughs> Not a great memory. But they let fear get a hold. Look at verse 28. The, the Lord heard the voice of your words. And he said, I've heard the, the voice and of the people which they've spoken. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments. I'm reading verse 28. Now verse 20, uh, verse 30 now. Go and say to them, return to your tents. But as for you, stand here by me, and I will speak all the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them. And so I, I really do understand, and God is really gracious to them. Like, I understand your fears. I understand, you know, it, it's too much. It was too much for you. But there's a sad reality to this that I believe Moses is saying this for us to understand the reality. And here's the sad reality. The sad reality is this. God always intended to speak directly with his people. But the people didn't want that. Now, again, let's not think sinister when I say that. This was not because they were evil or because they were, you know, they wanted to, they were wicked and they didn't care about God. They loved God. They truly cared about God, but it scared them. It overwhelmed them. And it's kind of a sad thing that, in fact, by the way, God, God gives into this and says, I'm going to give you a mediator, but here, here's the real reality, and I love saying this because I believe in it so much. There's never been a good mediator between God and man until Jesus. Nobody, and nobody since Jesus, by the way. Nobody can communicate the heart of God like God can. Nobody. But the means by which God was communicating put fear in the hearts of the people, and it freaked them out. And I know each one of us could, you know, we could be here on Wednesday night and say, man, I would love to hear the voice of God. I hate to tell you, but the reason that these things are in the Bible is because we're just like that. You know, we're just like that. And it's scary. And so it's easier to say, oh, man, let somebody, let somebody tell me. But did you know, and I think this is something, and it's kind of a tangent, but it's an important tangent. What is the purpose of church? I think we get, mis we get confused all the time. In fact, when the Bible talks about like the reason that God gave pastors and teachers, it's very clear and very specific. It's for one reason. It's for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 5. It's not to be the voice of God for people. Friends, there's no substitute for you hearing from God directly through his word, by his spirit. It's a great joy to get to teach the Bible. Don't misunderstand. I'm not like, this isn't me saying I don't like telling you this. I love talking about the Lord I love getting the opportunity to point people to Jesus, but I'm telling you, there's no substitute like Jesus. It's not enough. People treat, you can't treat, and you're not. I'm just saying too often, people treat church like a, I want God to speak to me there. But the real issue is, I come to church to be equipped so that I could hear God's voice in my world, in my life, in my home, in my school, in my workplace, among my friends, in the world God put me in. God does, not, God does not put people in ministry to be his voice totally. He still wants to be his voice. God still speaks. God still speaks. Please, please, please keep on hearing the voice of God in your own life. And I, my personal experience with God's voice, never heard him out loud, by the way. 
I've heard the voice of God through my children. That was out loud. And my wife and, you know, through pastors and so on and so forth. But I haven't never heard God's voice out loud, but I can tell you this. When I sense God speaking to me, it does scare me a little bit. It, the implications scare me. I believe God's spoken to me, and I have to respond to that. And the implications of responding to that are severe. I can tell you, um, 23 years ago, when God was clearly speaking to us to move to Eastern Europe, it was terrifying. It was terrifying on two levels. It was terrifying the idea of moving, and it was terrifying of the idea of staying when I knew God was saying go. And then your life just feels miserable because you're terrified, period. If I don't go, I'm terrified. If I do go, I'm terrified of what's going to happen. And I'm not joking. The day, no joke, the day that Joy and I committed ourselves, we said just between the two of us, we're going to Hungary. God's called us to Hungary. The day that God called us, I was an assistant high school pastor, which means nobody, at a church. I was, the day that we made this decision between the two of us in our apartment, I get two phone calls. I never get phone calls. I get two phone calls from two different pastors asking me to come and join them and be on their church staff. Great opportunities on the same day. And every single one, it was terrifying to say it, but it was so easy. No. God's made clear what we're supposed to do. And the next time I was as terrified as that was about 11 months ago. Same fear, same terror. I can stay, but if I do, I'm being disobedient. But if I go, I have to go, and I don't want to go. You understand how that works? Friends, and it's true in all of our lives. If, if there's not fear that's requiring faith, then what are we doing? God's big. God pulls us into things that require us to trust him. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Trusting God with your children might be the hardest thing you do. It's not about just going somewhere. Each of us have our own story. I, I can only use mine, but each of us have our own story. We have to learn to trust the Lord. It's not worth it. It's not ever worth it to um, let somebody else speak what God wants to speak to you. We can't settle for that because it gets misinterpreted or misunderstood. And the people, that's how. So if you've ever wondered, how did it stop that God didn't speak to people directly? It's never stopped. It's just people have said, Give me somebody else to tell me. That's how it all became. Look at chapter 6. We're going we're gonna to just bang in here to chapter 6 a bit. We're only going to cover two chapters, so peace be with you. We're good. This is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded, that you may observe them in the land which you're crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Verse 3, Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. First thing that God is saying here is this. He's saying, value my word, obey the things that I... T do what I ask of you to do. Just, if I'm asking you to do something, please do it. Make this your priority number one, and it will be well for you. And again and again and again in the book of Deuteronomy, God speaks of this. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings problem. Why? Is it because God wants to punish those who don't listen to him? No, it's not like that. Punishment comes... Or, or, or problems come, punishment, however you want to look at it, it comes because of the disobedience. Not because of God just wanting to hurt you, but because of you going down a path that is destructive. God's saying, I've got a path for you that is wonderful. Go down that path. It leads to blessing. Don't go down the path of, you know, that just leads to, 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 to hurts. Ironically, the path of blessing also hurts. There's pain, right? And there's hurt in trusting God. But it leads to deeper and greater and more valuable blessings. Look at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is called, in Hebrew, this is called the Shema. It's the most important prayer in all the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's, it is, it's, uh, rabbis say that you should pray this prayer twice every day, in the morning and at night. It's a beautiful prayer. It's also a, an absolute enigma. It's ironic that this would be the prayer that every Jew would pray because this is one of the most, 
it's a, it's a bizarre prayer. Not if you're a Christian, it's really easy, but notice what he says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But I want you to notice the thing that's ironic about this is that the Lord our God is a plural form for God. <laughs> so in the Lord our God speaks of the Trinity. It speaks of the plurality of God. Okay? That there are, it's God in multiple persons. But then he says this, the Lord is one. But here's the irony, the word for one is a compound word. <laughs> what does that mean? Let me tell you the other time that God uses this word for the word one. Because you think one is one, one is simple, one, one, one God, one, one, right? No. It's the same word used when it says that Adam and Eve knew each other and they became one flesh. Did they actually become one flesh? No. It's a compound idea of one. It's unity. It's connection. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So the most popular prayer among Jews in the world today speaks about the, the, the plurality of God. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then this great prayer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And by the way, Jesus would add with your mind as well. The bottom line is this. God wants us to love him with everything we got. God wants us, he's going to love you with everything he's got, and he wants you to love him with everything you got. That's how good, healthy relationships are supposed to be, right? Such a bummer when you see a relationship that's one-sided. Isn't that sad? Probably many of us have felt like we've been in a relationship that was one-sided. Whether that's the case or not, I don't know, but we've all felt that way. And what it boils down to is us having a relationship with God and putting our entire self into that relationship. God wants us to desire nothing but himself, which, by the way, sounds absolutely egocentric. Like, if I told Joy that, I just want you to think about me all the time, and only me, and nothing but me. Right? You might go, wow, that's cute. And then if I kept saying it, you're like, now it's getting psychotic. Right? It's a little strange. Right? If I, if I were to say, you know, the, the way that you're going to be the most blessed is to just constantly be thinking and drawing yourself closer to me. Isn't that strange? When God says it, we go, oh, that's beautiful. But if somebody else said it, we're like, that's kind of crazy. But when God says it, it is beautiful. And notice this. If I said that to my wife, that's a selfish act on my part. But when God says it, it's selfless. Why? Because God himself is the greatest joy a person could ever experience. And so selflessly, he says, I'm inviting you all to come into the greatest joy you could ever experience. Like, I'm inviting you into that. It's not selfish when you are the greatest, when you are the hope, when you are peace, when you are righteousness, when you are everything somebody will ever need in life. It's not selfish to say, come to me. It's selfless. And God is totally selfless when he says, I want to love you and I want you to love me with everything you've got because that's going to be where you're the happiest. This is where you'll be the most blessed. And so because God has loved us, we're called to respond with love. There are no, there are, you ready? This is it. You could write this one down. You won't once I say it, but this is how important it is. There are no verses in the Bible to suggest that God wants to keep distance from you. Did you know that? Not one verse there are no verses in the Bible where God says, let's keep some space. God wants you near him. Desperately wants you near him. Verse 6, these words which I command will be in your heart. I want you to notice something that in the Old Testament, God says it, and it's important through the entire New Testament as well, is that God's word is not as, it's ineffective in the mind, it's effective in the heart. I know tons of people who are theological giants, but God's word has not moved from mind to heart yet. We, God's, and, and I also know people that don't know that much, but man, they're on fire for Jesus. God's word is not meant to be just stuck in the head. It's meant to, be, it's meant to dwell in the heart of man. It's meant to dwell in our hearts. That's why the psalmist said, I'd got, I, I've hidden God's word in my heart. Why? Then I might not sin against you. Have you noticed that you know verses that tell you right and wrong, but you still sometimes do wrong? 
And you're wondering, how is that possible? And you think you're just a terrible human being? No. Consider, well, consider this. Is it possible that verse hasn't gone from head to heart yet? When we begin to hide God's word in our hearts, that's where we begin to see life transformation. Knowing something in the head is not the same as knowing something in the heart. And we want to move from head to heart. Verse 7, teach them diligently, your children. Talk to them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand, on the frontlets between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We are not meant to let God's word die with us. That's what is being said here. You and I are not to be the last generation that knows the word of God. Now, if Jesus decides to come back, that's his business. But until he comes back, we are not meant to be the end of what God wants to do in this world. We're meant to pass it on to our children. We're meant to pass it on to our grandchildren. And how do we do that? When we're walking, we talk about the Lord. When we're sitting, we talk. We find ways to engage our, you know, the next generation with the word of God. You've been given the treasure of God's word, and you're meant to help others, future generations, fall in love with the word of God. In Israel, you know, and it's true in all over the world, you'll see, sometimes you'll see Jews have these little boxes on their foreheads. And the boxes, and they'll have a, a little box on their hand. Or maybe you've seen a little doorpost thing. They'll have a little thing on the door. They're putting the Shema, they're putting these verses on, in a little scroll, and they put in a box on their head. They take it literal. And they'll pray this twice a day. Or it's on their doorpost. Okay? Um, I'm not suggesting you should do that. I'm suggesting get it into us. We want to get the love of God and the heart of God and the word of God into us so that it spills out of us. If the extent of our Christian experience is in this building or in this church, then we're failing, right? That's the idea. It's what does it look like in my school? What does it look like in my home? What does it look like, like just with my kids? And you might say, gosh, my kids aren't walking with the Lord and I don't have opportunity to bring God into that. that I understand that. You, we look for opportunities. We pray for opportunities. We pray for them. We're looking for that moment when we can bring God into that in a way that is not going to be defeating or discouraging. And it's hard. But that's what he, Moses is talking about here. Discovering ways that you and I bring the Lord Jesus into the hearts of people. Not easy to do. Verse 10, it'll be when the Lord God brings you into the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give large and beautiful cities, houses full of all good things. Then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. Verse 14, do not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused and destroy you from the face of the earth. You will not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Massah. It's interesting because as Moses is preparing the people to go into the land of uh, Canaan, now let me ask you, because you're, you're, you're all geniuses here, what's waiting for them in the land of Canaan? Tiny people? There's giants in the land, right? There's, there's difficulty. There's hardship that's coming into the land. Do you notice that here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, or 6, excuse me, God is not preparing them for the hardships that they're about to face? Guess what he's preparing them for? The hardships that come after success. Isn't that interesting? And let me tell you why. Because God is going to bring the victory through those difficult days. They were responsible for how they handled the victory days. God was responsible for bringing the victory. They were responsible for how they handled it. In other words, well, well let me just give you an example. The very first battle they fought. How much battling did they really do? Walking around Jericho. Nothing. Which is one of, yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to Joshua. God did the whole work. God did all that work, but what was on them was, how are you going to handle success? So it's interesting in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that God is more concerned with how they handle their success it's interesting. I don't think God's is as concerned about how we handle the hunger. And what I mean by the hunger is that desire. When you're like, man, if I, 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 want, this, I want God to do this in my life. I, I want God to bring victory in this area of my life. You'll probably do better in that season than when you are like, my life's good. It's interesting that God's warning them about success. You know, if I were to ask before I said this, who wants to live a struggle-free life, we'd most of us put our hands up. And that's, no, that's called being normal, by the way. 
But what if, it, what if that's not the place where you're going to have the hardest time with your relationship with God? What if the hardest place that you're going to have a relationship with God is, is in your successes? The ease of life was a bigger concern for the Lord than the struggle of life. Fight for what God's giving you. Struggle for that. You know, be dependent upon God. The minute you get it, you're and you know, by the way, notice, what was he concerned about? That they would go after other gods. That they would find justification for why it wasn't God that did the victory in their life, but it was something else. And Moses says over and over in the verses that we just read, and you can look back over them, he says this, when I, when I, when I. God was going to bring victory, but now how are you going to handle your success? Interesting issue. Verse 20, and we'll finish up in this section. When your son comes and says, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the, the whole law of God? Then you will say, we were slaves in Egypt. God brought us out of Egypt. And the Lord showed signs and wonders. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us a land which he swore to our fathers. You hear it? This was, it was, when your kids come and ask, how did we get this land? You're going to tell them, it was the Lord. It was the Lord from beginning to end. And God, verse 24, commanded us to observe these statutes, verse 25, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe them. How can we help future generations to follow the Lord? You ready? By reminding them of God's faithfulness. If you've walked with the Lord for a while, you have a story to tell the next generation. Hey, God's still faithful. Their story will not be your story, but this part will be. The faithful God to you will be the faithful God to them. Isn't that awesome? They're not going to have the same story that you had. They can't. It's a different time. You don't have the same story that your grandparents or parents have. You have yours. But your story of God's faithfulness is what's going to, that's going to light a fire in them. I know this. I, I'm a product of this. I felt called into, God, into service, into serving the Lord and following the Lord because of the people that came before me who told me about how faithful God would be if I'd trust him. Straight out, I know, I'm serving the Lord today because an older generation said, we've seen God work, and what he did in us, he could do in you. And that inspired me. If God could do it then, he could still do it now. And now that's our job to pass on to the next group. By the way, if you're 20 in this room, the next group is 12. There's no expiration date on that, is there? We just keep doing it. We keep telling people, God's always going to be faithful. God's always going to be faithful. We pass on, we get to pass on the goodness of God to the next generation. Amen? Let's pray and we'll close in a song of worship. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the just opportunity to look at this. And I just pray, God, that it would have value and meaning and depth into our lives. Lord, I pray that even as we, as we worship you, God, that there would be a sense in us that we would say tonight, man, Lord, I just want to follow you more. I want to trust you more. I want to believe you more. I want to, God, I, I want to be an example to others of just pure faithfulness from you, God. You have been faithful and maybe tonight you would say that. Maybe your marriage is a product of God's faithfulness. Maybe you're, you're the place that you're working at, that's a product of God's faithfulness to you. Maybe the kids that you have, they're a product of God's faithfulness, God's grace, God's goodness, God's love. Maybe the fact that you're even here tonight, you could look at that and you could be like, yeah, this is, man, my life is a product of God's faithfulness. And I pray that's your story. And if it is, we just give, God, we give you thanks for being a faithful and a good God. We worship you tonight, Lord, because you're good. Help us, Lord, cause us to walk in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is strengthening and encouraging you in your faith. We would love for you to download our app and share your story of how God is working in your life. Also, if you would like to invest in the ministry of Calvary San Diego, you can financially partner with us by visiting our website at calvarysd.com give. Thank you so much and have a great day.